I'm going to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Carl Soleil, who's going to moderate the Q&A. Uh, there are tons of questions. We've been going through them, uh, looking for the good ones. And uh, take it away, Carl. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so this is, uh, I think we'll start with Peter on this one, but all of you can jump in. There was uh, a number of questions from people like Theo and Yoast in the pod. Uh, that we're talking about uh, the the whole concept of shooting the film in black and white, what the post, mm -hmm. uh, post process was with that. Was it actually shot in black and white or was it shot in color and that was added uh, later? And was there ever like a conversation about it, whether whether to do it in, in black and white or not? Um, the conversation about doing it in black and white goes back 20 years, which is the first time we budgeted the movie. Um, and yes, we did shoot it in black and white. We shot it digitally in black and white. Um, obviously, 20 years ago, if we had done it then, that would have been different because we would have shot it on black and white film stock. Um, we did do camera tests, and um, one of the cameras was a color camera. So, so we even even though we wanted to do black and white, we still did our due diligence and and uh, and tested a black and white camera. Um, and we still arrived at the same place where we thought we would be, is we shot on a monochrome red camera. And um, we have the benefit of having um, our colorist and our DI suite in our edit rooms. And so when we do a camera test, we can get pretty thorough about it. We can take the files from the camera, take it right into DI, um, and show uh, Eric Messerschmidt and David Fincher what stuff is going to look like, how they want to uh, affect the image. Um, but yes, black and white all the way from day one. Wow. Wow. And I just love all the little tiny detail. If you haven't had a chance to see the trailer on a on a big screen, um, you know, definitely do it just because if you're a fan of old film, just seeing like all the little, you know, like flecks of like just a tiny amount of like little dirt to make the print look a little bit older. It, it's uh, it really kind of adds to the overall ambience of the film. So really like that. Um, there's another question in here, just uh, Joe, it was asking about um, how you guys work with After Effects. So I think this one's probably mostly for Ben, um, but they were wondering about when once the Roto work starts in Premiere and moves over to After Effects, um, what's the process like getting that to a final VFX shot? You guys do all of this in-house. There's, I don't believe you guys use any type of, uh, you know, sending those types of shots out to uh, to like a, a, a third party a VFX house? Uh, we actually do. Um, the way that our workflow is designed, uh, despite the fact that you know, we are shooting in 8K and uh, working with huge files, uh, we also need to make sure that we can edit with those very efficiently in real time. Um, and so we're not actually doing the offline comps in After Effects and even the editorial work at full resolution. Uh, so what we will do is um, the work will start in Premiere, uh, detailed work that can't be achieved to essentially prove the concept and keep the story flow uninterrupted. We'll move over into After Effects, uh, where we'll refine it. Uh, and then every single shot that has any effects on it does actually go through a final VFX pipeline at uh, full resolution, essentially, um, with uh, VFX artists, some in-house and some out-of-house. Awesome. But you guys really focus on that idea of having something as close to the final film as possible during like all the reviews and everything else before you finally turn things over. Um, I think that we're we're making we're 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 making sure that everything, with the exception of final resolution, um, and the fact that we're not working in HDR, uh, but we make sure that everything in editorial looks as tightly controlled um, creatively and technically as the final, as much as we can without actually slowing our close down. To the point even where, um, you know, we, we have some sound processing that uh, was done to make, uh, like the, the Mank trailer, for example, sound older. Uh, we worked with uh, our, our sound, sound mixing team and sound engineers up at Skywalker Sound to actually build uh, audio plugins that were going into submixes in our premiere timelines so that we could actually process our very modern day, current, wonderful, crisp sounding uh, dialogue and audio into that degraded sound for the trailer so that it was playing back in real time so that we could simulate what the final sound mix was actually going to sound in offline. Wonderful. 
Um, this, the, this also in the same vein, the attention to detail I always find fascinating. You know, I love the, uh, even in Mindhunter as an example, uh, you know, the use of like a, a post-processing effect to kind of simulate anamorphic uh, lenses was, was fantastic. Um, you know, obviously attention to detail is something David Fincher is really well known for. What, what other, uh, what other unique factors are there in working with, uh, with Fincher on a project? Um, well, one of them, uh, I'll, one of them is endurance, you know, and, and this is one of the, I think one of the great satisfactions of working with him is that, is that he is always going to want something to be better. He's going to want more of it. And, and, you know, our, our whole thing is that we will work up until the last minute. So we get as much of the work on the screen as possible. And when I say the satisfaction of it is that what happens is that you're sitting there working and, you know, maybe you're tired and you've put a lot of hours in and, and then he still wants more and more and more. What the payoff is, is when you finally get there and you look at the distance that you've gone because he's pushed everybody, there's real satisfaction because you do see it. You do see a result. You do see an improvement. You do see something better. And that's really satisfying. And um, I definitely have been in situations on other projects where, you know, you, 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 you get the whip, you, you get whipped uh, and a year later, it just, it's not better. You know what I mean? Um, and that's just not true with David. There is payoff and it's very satisfying. Wonderful. I also, I also think one of the, one of the things that I've learned uh, is that um, what David's expectations are, 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 you know, he expects perfection. This has to be perfect. This has to be right. We're going to make this the best that it can be. Uh, but I haven't, I found it very uh, collaborative that he will say, make a comment about something and you're a part of getting it there. He's not, there's no micromanaging or anything happening. It's we're going to get it there. And this is what I'm looking for. And now we get to be a part of that. And I've always felt very much involved, not just pressing the buttons and doing the work really actually Think, okay, this is what the expectation is. How do we do that? Not just let's go do it. How do we do that? How do we get that to be that thing? And like Peter said, it really pays off. If you really feel proud, I think no matter what your role is on one of these movies, you really feel proud that you contributed to it because you did. You 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 expects the best from you, and you want to deliver the best. And 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 I need to add to that. You know what what Ben is saying is that one of the great things about our team is that. I think it's almost sport on our team to try to uh, anticipate and try to get ahead of David, and uh, and that makes the, the that makes the, the product better as well. Because there's maybe even other little places where David didn't see something or whatever, but Ben or Jennifer or Russell or Casey or somebody else saw something, and we 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 took the initiative and cleaned it up. So we are definitely all fully committed and brainwashed appropriately for for working with David. Absolutely. Um, this kind of leads into that, and I think, Ben, you kind of answered this a little bit with some of the split screen uh, uh, tech that you showed there, but uh, Anthony Nelson wants to know, how do you sort through the hundreds of takes that typically happen, and how often do you end up using the last take? <laughs> uh, we make that Kirk's problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, uh, we have a, um, when it comes to sorting through the takes, there's the uh, assistant editor uh, technical side that uh, Jennifer, Russell, me, and Casey are a part of, of getting everything together uh, for the editorial process. And then it gets handed off to Kirk. Um, we get it organized in a uh, sorry, very uh, pre-planned way so that Kirk can go through it very quickly, uh, which he does. Um, uh, but we have a process by, by which, um, especially on something like Mank, where uh, it's shooting here and we can get the dailies and process them very quickly, uh, as opposed to something like Mindhunter that was shooting across the country and the dailies have, are, are shuttled over and that can sometimes lead to a little bit of delays. Uh, we will you know, shoot on day one and on the morning of day two, uh, the assistant editing team will be in there getting all the dailies ready for Kirk and by 10 o'clock, Kirk can sit down and start watching through them all. Um, so we do have it very dialed in and very um, efficient and a process by which we receive it all, um, get it all organized, um, get it into Premiere. Uh, we have some automation that's involved as well um, to uh, get things out of the dailies processing pipeline and into Premiere. 
um, which has been demoed in the past with some other Adobe events, um, and is continually evolving. Um, and then, uh, how frequently do we use the last one? Um, the answer to that is actually unknown. Uh, one of the really cool things uh, about these projects is that uh, by the time the footage gets to us, uh, we have a very clear picture of um, what David's preferences may be based on the script notes and other information that's coming in on set. And so everything that goes to Kirk is usable uh, and, and, and that gets put in front of David. And uh, really, uh, it's not about the last one. It's not about the first one. They're all, in general, good performances that may get chosen between. Um, so uh, Kirk sits down and watches it all. And he figures out what's going to go in there. And then we'll go back through it. And it'll be refined, and uh, what may have been a great last take ends up being the second take. It's not, we don't start last first. Uh, some people do that, but we don't start last first and then replace when the last one's not working. We watch everything. Wow. Wow. Um, I've got a great question here from Miriam, uh, Miriam Sobrino. Uh, is asking about aspect ratios. And we live in a world today where you can pretty much deliver at whatever aspect ratio you really want to. Uh, but her question has to do with, did, uh, was, was a 133 to 1, uh, you know, Academy flat uh, aspect ratio ever considered? Was there any consideration over Netflix's preference for like wider aspect ratios? Um, it, did that ever come up at all in the uh, pre-production? Um, no, there was a little, there's a little discussion of it. There's a couple of places where we do go to, uh, actually it's 137 was the aspect ratio used in the 30s. And so there's a couple of places where we actually do use that during the movie. Um, but David has sort of settled on, onto this aspect ratio that we've used for Mindhunter and for Mank. And uh, Netflix is, you know, very open. I mean, they, you know, any distributor always wants to fill the whole screen, you know, and, and, but, but, uh, you know, not only on this project, but other projects that I've worked on and, and, and friends have worked on, Netflix has been very supportive of filmmakers if they want to do, uh, you know, different aspect ratios. Here's a great question for Ben and Jennifer. This comes from Clarence Dang. Uh, what's the dynamic like in terms of delegating or splitting duties as an assistant editor? Uh, how do you build trust with your assist team? Jennifer, you want to start with that one? <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think the thing that's kind of unique about our team is that because we all have such a good understanding of the workflow and because we've worked with each other before, um, we're, we're able to kind of like tag team and jump into various tasks. And, um, you know, like we have... On, on this show, Casey was working in visual effects and we had three assistants helping Kirk with the dailies and, and the normal editorial process. But because we all have a good knowledge of that, if Casey needs our help, we can dive in and help him out with whatever he's dealing with and vice versa. And so, um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, just to build that out, um, Everybody knows how to do everything. Uh, and so it's not a question of um, how do you spread this out among the people that can, among the people that do the job. It's more uh, what what is the priority and how do we organize the day? Um, but one of the really cool things about that is that uh, I might be working on dailies to get the dailies in and then uh, all of a sudden something happens where uh, I need to switch over. And I can just turn around and say, hey, Jennifer, can you take over the daily? This is something that's happening immediately. I already know where it all is. Like, I had a conversation with Peter earlier this morning, but it wasn't supposed to happen until 2 p.m. Now it's happening right now. I'm going to switch over to that. Can you pick up on the dailies? And we just shift seats virtually. <laughs> Um, I'm getting a lot of questions here uh, from people like Ricardo asking just about the process with audio turnover and how much the script plays and metadata plays in your workflow. Uh, ben, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, let me let me see if I get the parts correct, though. We've got audio turnover. 
which I'm happy to talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, and then script and metadata, I'm not really 100% sure how to answer um, because uh, the way that we work is that everything gets built into the story and the structure of the edit. Um, so the script, as it has, it's it's always a reference. It's a guide. It's obviously the foundation for everything that we're making. Um, but the uh, if if in the edit room, Kirk and David decide to change the script, and that goes to the sound mix, the sound mix is not going to look back at the script and say, "Hey, these lines are out of order," or "That line has been removed." It's all deliberate the whole time. Um, nothing is making it into the final that shouldn't be there. And that's also it's a part all a living of, document. Yeah, I got it. Absolutely. Um, and that's also a part of, uh, we haven't mentioned this yet, but that's a big part of my job, Jennifer's job, and, and all the assistants um, at number 13 is to make sure that throughout the entirety of the process, that time, that, that working timeline that is the current, the final one or the, the evolving final one uh, has everything in it that should be there and nothing in it that shouldn't be there. We're always making, we're always working towards a final move. Uh, in terms of sound turnovers, um, if you know the term sound over uh, or sound turnover enough to ask that question, then it probably works exactly as you expect. <laughs> uh, where we, <laughs> we we make AAFs and references of the audio and picture, uh, and we send those over to the Skywalker sound team, and they then uh, they have all of the production audio as well, and they have a whole set of tools, some of which we use and some of which are proprietary within uh, their four walls, uh, to reconstitute everything from the production side based on how we used it in the edit. And then they just, they do their thing better than we could even imagine. And then it comes back to us, we drop it in, and the movie then sounds great. 